Now I'm going to deal with the uh, peritoneum in a sagittal section of the trunk. Let's first of all draw the trunk. I will start from the pelvis, from the area that is in front of the pubic symphysis. This is the anterior abdominal wall and the diaphragm here, thoracoabdominal diaphragm. Now the posterior abdominal wall, lumbar region and the sacral region. Now let's uh, put some of the viscera in here. First of all, I will put the liver, diaphragmatic and visceral. This is the visceral surface of the liver. Returning back to the diaphragmatic surface of the liver. And then here is the stomach, the wall of the stomach. I will put some rugi here to indicate that it's a stomach. Then the colon, this is the transverse colon actually, and uh, on the posterior abdominal wall, I'll draw the pancreas, and then I'll draw the small intestine, a piece, a loop of small intestine here. Then let's put some of the pelvic viscera. Here we have the rectum and anal canal, and this is a female subject, so I'll draw the uterus and vagina. This is a posterior vaginal fornix here. And anteriorly is the urethra and the urinary bladder in front of the pubic symphysis. Now let's sketch uh, the peritoneum. The peritoneum, first of all, we should remember that the peritoneum is divided into visceral and parietal peritoneum layers. And these layers are continuous with each other. So it is a single sheet peritoneum, parietal and visceral layer of peritoneum. The parietal layer of peritoneum is related to the parietes or the walls and the visceral layer is related to the viscera but they are continuous with each other and the cavity of the peritoneum is a potential space that is located between the visceral and parietal layers of the peritoneum. It's a very thin space, a potential space that is located between these two layers. I'll draw the parietal peritoneum in uh, blue. So I will start in the region at the anterior abdominal wall that is probably close to the umbilicus. Go up. This is parietal peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall. And then the peritoneum uh, lines the diaphragm and reflected from the diaphragm to the diaphragmatic surface of the liver. Here, as it is reflected on the liver, it will form the visceral peritoneum. So I will change the color into pink and this is the visceral peritoneum now covering the liver, the diaphragmatic surface of the liver and then it is reflected on the visceral surface of the liver here close to the hilum of the liver. It will be reflected as the anterior layer of the lesser omentum between the liver and the lesser curvature of the stomach. This is the stomach and then passing on the anterior surface of the stomach to the greater curvature of the stomach and then reflected from the greater curvature of the stomach as the greater omentum. So this is the anterior layer of the greater omentum. The greater omentum is a double layer and it will be reflected backwards toward the transverse column. So it passes around the transverse colon, the peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum, and then reflected from the transverse colon to the posterior abdominal wall where it reaches the site of the pancreas. This reflection is called the transverse mesocolon. Then it covers the pancreas. The most of the pancreas is a retroperitoneum structure. It has no mesentery, unlike the, for example, here we have the transverse colon, which has mesentery. This is a piece of peritoneum that extends from the transverse colon to the posterior abdominal wall. And then as this peritoneum covers the pancreas, it is still visceral peritoneum, but as it reaches the posterior abdominal wall, now it becomes the parietal peritoneum. So I'm going to continue it in blue, covering the posterior abdominal wall, and then reflected from the posterior abdominal wall at the 
left of the transverse process of L2 vertebra, it will be reflected as the mesentery of the small intestine. Now it should be visceral peritoneum. So this is a visceral peritoneum as a double fold of visceral peritoneum. It encloses the small intestine. And this is a loop of small intestine representing that and returns back as a double fold of peritoneum to the posterior abdominal wall. So this is the mesentery of the small intestine. Now at this point it will come back to be a parietal peritoneum and so I'm going to draw it in blue and continues as the parietal peritoneum of the posterior abdominal wall then onto the pelvis and as it reaches the rectum it will be reflected in the front of the rectum. The rectum has no mesentery. The peritoneum will be reflected as a visceral peritoneum in the front of the rectum then dips into a pouch that is reflected from the rectum onto the posterior vaginal fornix and then onto the posterior wall of the uterus. This is the rectouterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas. In the male it is reflected directly onto the urinary bladder and is called the recto vesical pouch but in the female it is reflected onto the posterior vaginal fornix and the posterior wall of the uterus. It covers the entire posterior wall of the uterus reflected onto the fundus and then the anterior wall of the uterus about upper two-thirds and reflected on the urinary bladder, upper surface of the urinary bladder creating another pouch here and that is the uterovesical pouch. This uh, pouch is not present in the male because in the male there is no vagina and uterus intervening between the rectum and the urinary bladder. And here the peritoneum will be reflected back to the anterior abdominal wall becoming parietal peritoneum. I'm going to change the color into uh, blue. So this is the parietal peritoneum reflected onto the anterior abdominal wall and returning back as the parietal peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall into the point where we first started. We've started here approximately at the level of the umbilicus. So you can see here that the peritoneum is a continuous layer. It's a continuous sheet and where it lines the walls it is called parietal where it uh, covers the viscera it is called the visceral the peritoneal cavity is a, a continuous cavity uh, from the uh, abdomen into the uh, pelvis and this cavity is located between the visceral and parietal layers of peritoneum it is exaggerated here in this diagram otherwise it is a potential space and the uh, two uh, layers are in many places they are opposed to each other and where there is a double layer of peritoneum uh, as we see here in the uh, small intestine it is called mesentery sometimes it's called ligament sometimes it's called omentum like here in the uh, lesser omentum and the greater omentum now uh, let's continue this diagram because here this sac, this per part of the peritoneal cavity here, this is called the greater sac. And there is another sac which is located uh, behind, mainly behind the stomach, behind the uh, liver, and extends a little bit into the greater omentum. This is called the lesser sac. So let me draw the lesser sac. This is again a visceral peritoneum covering the liver, and then the visceral surface of the liver will be reflected onto the lesser curvature of the stomach creating a double fold with the fold that we have uh, just drawn earlier and then on the back of the stomach returning into the greater curvature of the stomach and uh, this uh, continues as a fold double fold with the fold that we have just drawn of the greater omentum and returns back to enclose the transverse colon and reflected backwards to the posterior abdominal wall as the transverse mesocolon until it reaches the pancreas which is retroperitoneal structure now it will be become a parietal peritoneum so I change the color into blue and that is the parietal peritoneum returning back to the same point 
This creates a sac, a lesser sac, or we call it the omental bursa, that is located behind the uh, stomach. At the beginning, this, um, I mean, embryologically speaking, this sac was not present, but because of the folding uh, of the gut and because of mainly of the rotation of the stomach, then this diverticulum or rhesus will be created behind the stomach and this rhesus uh, communicates with the greater sac through an opening. This is the approximate site of the opening. It is said to be located in the free border of the lesser omentum and it is called the epiploic foramen or the foramen of uh, Winslow. It represents the only communication between the greater sac and the lesser sac. This, this arrow here goes from the greater sac into the lesser sac through the epiploic foramen. And this is the only natural communication between the two. Otherwise, in order to access the lesser sac, um, um, you have to uh, either cut or incise the lesser omentum, or you can cut or incise uh, this part of the greater omentum that extends between the greater curvature of the stomach and the transverse colon that is called the gastrocolic omentum or you can incise uh, or cut this double fold of peritoneum here between the transverse colon and the pancreas which is the transverse mesocolon but keep in mind that all these peritoneal folds are vascular folds and so they contain blood vessels also I want you to notice the extension of the lesser sac into the greater omentum in life uh, this extension of the lesser sac into the greater omentum is obliterated so the gastrocolic omentum is fusing with the anterior surface of the colon and these folds are brought together and instead of having four layers they will become uh, double layers and um, the um, lesser sac is confined to the area that is behind the stomach and behind the liver. Also I want you to notice here that uh, the liver is not uh, completely covered by peritoneum as you can see here and that there is an area here in the liver that is uh, the bare area of the liver it is called where the liver is in direct contact with the uh, diaphragm and this area is located between two folds of peritoneum that are called the coronary ligament. So uh, this is the superior and inferior layers of the coronary ligament. Also note that the viscera are not located inside the peritoneal cavity. They are almost completely covered by peritoneum, but they are not inside the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity, as I mentioned, uh, in the form of a greater sac or the lesser sac is a thin space potential space and does not contain these viscera but the viscera are almost uh, completely covered by peritoneum and these viscera that are almost completely covered by peritoneum and uh, usually they have a double fold of peritoneum suspending them like the stomach here are called intraperitoneal so an intraperitoneal structure is not does not mean that is located inside the peritoneal cavity but almost completely covered by peritoneum Again here, the transverse colon is almost completely covered by peritoneum. The small intestine is almost completely covered by peritoneum and has mesentery, so it is intraperitoneal. While if we look at the pancreas, for example, it doesn't have a mesentery and it has a, 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 an area that is not covered by peritoneum. And so it is a retroperitoneal structure. In, in fact, most of the pancreas is retroperitoneal structure except for the tail of the pancreas. Also, look at the uh, rectum. The rectum has no mesentery. It's covered by peritoneum either anteriorly or anteriorly and laterally, so it is retroperitoneal. Here, I want you to notice uh, that the peritoneum, again, uh, the peritoneum of the abdomen is continuous with that of the pelvis and you can see here the peritoneum is as if it is draped over uh, pelvic viscera which are located outside the peritoneum. This is an important relation here, the posterior vaginal fornix, which is uh, related to the peritoneum. This is the only part of the vagina that is related to the uh, peritoneum. 
the urinary bladder uh, has its superior surface only the superior surface of the urinary bladder in the female is related to the peritoneum now let me follow the peritoneum in a horizontal section almost at the level of uh, t12 vertebra I will arrange the viscera so that uh, the section uh, looks uh, similar to the um, axial CT or MRI section because you will be more familiar with uh, these sections better than uh, displaying them in an anatomical section. In other words, I will draw the section so that as if you are looking at the section of the body from below. So this is the liver, visceral surface of the liver here. Now let me draw the stomach. This is a section on the stomach showing the part of the body and this represents the rugi, the longitudinal folds of the mucosa of the stomach. Here the rugi leads into the pyloric, sphinct, uh, pyloric canal. Also on the left side of the body, the other viscous is the spleen. So this is the spleen here and uh, plaster to the posterior abdominal wall are the kidneys in section they look oval in shape this is the left kidney and here's the right kidney so to make things look better i will try to draw the vertebra this is supposed to be t12 vertebra another transverse process on the right side and here is the vertebral canal so in the periphery here it's the body wall uh, where uh, there are muscles and ribs here because uh, ribs are also related to the liver abdominal viscera liver on the right side and on the left side the uh, ribs are related to the spleen 9 uh, 10 and the 11th rib are also related to the spleen and here there are muscles of the erector spiny muscle and some muscles of the posterior abdominal wall which I am not going to draw let me put the two major vessels here in the posterior abdominal wall that is the aorta and the inferior vena cava so this is the aorta the aorta is toward the left side so this is the aorta the aorta is toward the left side and here is the inferior vena cava it has thinner wall being a vein and a little bit flattened it's on the right side the inferior vena cava now I will draw the parietal peritoneum starting it is in blue again starting at a point on the anterior abdominal wall in front of the liver this is the parietal peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall going back to the posterior abdominal wall until it reaches the site of the kidney and at this point it is going to cover the kidney so it will become a visceral peritoneum drawing it in pink covers the kidney and is reflected from the kidney as a fold this is one layer of the fold extending from the kidney into the uh, spleen and this is called the lyene or renal ligament. Lyene means spleen and renal, lyene or renal ligament. Peritoneum encloses the spleen, completely encloses the spleen. So the spleen is an intraperitoneal structure. And return back to the hilum of the spleen, where the lyene or renal ligament originally uh, was attached. This is the region of the hilum of the spleen where vessels pass in and out of the spleen. And then it's going to be reflected into the greater curvature of the stomach in a double fold of peritoneum. Uh, this is a one layer of the fold to the greater curvature of the stomach. And this is called the gastrosplenic ligament. Gastrosplenic ligament. We will notice that all these folds and ligaments, they, most of them, they contain blood vessels. And so from the greater curvature of the stomach, the 
Visceral peritoneum covers the anterior surface of the stomach and reaches the lesser curvature of the stomach. At the lesser curvature of the stomach, it is going to be reflected towards the liver and this uh, fold of peritoneum is called the lesser omentum. It has a free border, so I'm not going to attach it here in section directly to the liver because representing it's a free border. So this is the free border here. It's a thick border returning back into the lesser curvature of the stomach. And from the lesser curvature of the stomach, it covers the posterior surface of the stomach until it reaches the greater curvature and reflected back to the spleen. So the visceral peritoneum here on the posterior surface of the stomach will reach the greater curvature of the stomach and will be reflected from here to the hilum of the spleen again, creating the second layer of the gastrosplenic ligament. Then the, from the hilum of the spleen, it will be reflected back onto the kidney, creating the second uh, layer of the uh, lienorenal ligament, the double fold of peritoneum, and then around the kidney, the kidney has no mesentery, it is a retroperitoneal structure, in fact it's a, a primary retroperitoneal structure, and now the peritoneum will become parietal peritoneum, it covers the posterior abdominal wall. At this position, there is psoas major muscle and then passes in front of the abdominal aorta and the inferior vena cava and then reaches the right kidney. So when it reaches the right kidney, it becomes a visceral peritoneum. I'll draw it in pink, covering the anterior surface of the kidney. The kidney has no mesentery and reaching back to the posterior abdominal wall becoming parietal peritoneum. So I'll draw it again in blue. And returning to the same point where we have just started. From this point it's going to be reflected as a double fold of peritoneum. Now I'm going to draw one of the leaves of this double fold. And this is the this is the falciform ligament, one of the leaves of the falciform ligament extending from the diaphragm anterior abdominal wall to the liver, and the peritoneum encloses the liver, completely surrounds the liver here. Of course, there is a bare area which is shown in longitudinal section, but not in this section. This is the visceral peritoneum covering the liver encloses the liver and then this is the second fold or the second leaf of the fold of the falciform ligament returning back. So you can see again that the peritoneum is visceral and parietal. It is a continuous sheet of peritoneum uh, changing names and uh, having folds, different folds as we have just seen. The falciform ligament, the lesser omentum, the gastrosplenic ligament, the lienorenal ligament, and it's a continuous cavity, which is actually, as I said, it's a potential space, but here it has been exaggerated. Here, this is the greater sac of peritoneum, and the lesser sac is located behind the stomach and the lesser omentum. So this is the lesser omentum, and this is the lesser sac. It has an opening here, uh, which is between the free border of the lesser omentum and the inferior vena cava, which is located posteriorly. And this opening is the same as this one. It is the epiploic foramen. And this is, again, the direction of the arrow, which passes into the foramen, from the greater sac to the lesser sac. In the free border of the lesser omentum, there are three structures. A posterior structure, which is big, and this is the portal vein. And then there are two anterior structures. One of them, I'm going to draw it in green. And that is located on the right side. 
and this is the bile duct and the other one I'm going to draw it in red it's an artery it is the hepatic artery located on the left side the bile duct is located on the right side both of them are located anterior to the portal vein and so the epiploic foramen here when you pass your finger into the epiploic foramen in order to enter into the lesser sac your finger will be located between the inferior vena cava posteriorly and uh, the portal vein anteriorly if you go superiorly you are going to touch the liver and if you go inferiorly you will touch the uh, first part of the duodenum now let me give you an idea about how the lesser sac is formed we have to go back to embryology I'll draw the gut tube the, the tube the gut starts as a single tube and this tube starts to have dilatations that has some folding but originally it is a single tube so this is the gut tube here here is the distension that is going to form the stomach and it is divided into foregut, midgut and hindgut originally the gut is suspended from the posterior abdominal wall by a layer of mesentery which is a dorsal mesentery so this is the dorsal mesentery that suspends the whole gut tube is suspended by this mesentery whether foregut midgut or hindgut it's the dorsal mesentery in addition to that there is a ventral mesentery and this ventral mesentery is only attached to the foregut anteriorly or ventrally it is attached to the foregut during development the liver grows in the ventral mesentery of the foregut it's a foregut derivative so the liver grows here this is where the liver grows and thus it will divide the ventral mesentery into two parts a part that extends between the liver and the diaphragm anterior abdominal wall and this is the falciform ligament and a part that extends between the liver and the stomach and this is the lesser omentum so here you can see that the falciform ligament which uh, stretches from the anterior abdominal wall encloses the liver and is reflected to the uh, stomach and uh, lesser curvature of the stomach as the lesser omentum originally these two layers or these two folds were a single fold that is the ventral mesentery in addition the spleen grows in the dorsal mesentery of the foregut so this is the region of the spleen here it grows in the dorsal mesentery of the foregut and again it divides the dorsal mesentery here into two parts a part between the spleen and the stomach and that is the gastrosplenic ligament and a part here between the uh, spleen and the posterior abdominal wall where the kidney is going to be formed and this part is called the lieno renal ligament so lieno renal ligament here and the gastrosplenic ligament originally they were the dorsal mesentery of the foregut where the spleen uh, uh, started to grow in this region dividing it into two parts now let me show you these details in another diagram to trying to represent the rotation of the foregut rotation of the stomach the stomach actually rotates 90 degrees so that its um, left surface becomes anterior and its right surface becomes posterior now let me use another diagram for further clarification this is the stomach beginning of the duodenum this is where the kidney is located on the posterior abdominal wall and now I will draw the uh, peritoneum I will draw it as um, in, in one color I'm going to use the green color so here is the peritoneum on the posterior abdominal wall reflected in front of the kidney and then it is reflected from the kidney to the stomach but because the stomach is going to rotate there will be like a recess here 
then returns into the greater curvature of the stomach reflected from the greater curvature to the lesser curvature of the stomach from the lesser curvature it goes toward the liver and returns back as the lesser omentum and then on the posterior surface of the stomach to the greater curvature and then returning back as a double fold of the dorsal mesentery and the mesentery here in front of the right kidney so this is what happens the stomach rotates this is how the stomach rotates it rotates so that uh, the, the left surface of the stomach becomes anterior and the right surface of the stomach becomes posterior because the stomach is suspended in a dorsal mesentery then the dorsal mesentery will become folded and the uh, greater sac will have a diverticulum or a recess behind the stomach and this is called the lesser sac and it has an opening here behind the free border of the lesser omentum this is the free border of the lesser omentum which is shown here to complete the picture let me draw the spleen the spleen will grow in this dorsal mesentery and it will be covered by the peritoneum because it grows within the dorsal mesentery so the peritoneum will come to cover the spleen and therefore we will have two folds here of the dorsal mesentery one of them between the spleen and the kidney and that is called the lienorenal ligament and the other between the spleen and the greater curvature of the stomach and fundus of the stomach and this is called the gastrosplenic ligament